Thank you, Sir George. And they say that all good things come to those who wait, so I hope that the Minister will be able to uh, listen to my words and uh, reassure me that I haven't waited in vain. Thank you for the chance to speak in this debate. When over 40, 50 colleagues turn up in Westminster Hall, for those listening who aren't familiar, we clearly have a problem. Uh, and I want to suggest, actually, that we have two problems here that the Minister has the great honour of helping us deal with. One is the very serious problem of the increasing number of people in this country who find themselves in the turmoil of addictive gambling and online gambling. It's a real problem. And we have a second problem, which is the fragility of the finances of racing, a sport that we all love. And I think the real issue is to try and be clear about those two problems and not to conflate them too much as they have been and to work out how to deal with them both. But they are both real. Uh, so, George, I have no particular interest in racing other than a long family uh, history and connection. I've been to the races many times, both before and as a member of parliament, occasionally as a guest of the BHA, uh, who supported the work that I did creating the Bridge of Hope charity. And I was closely involved with Pride with the 2013 bill. My uh, great friend, the member for Suffolk West, Newmarket, and those of us in the industry who made sure that offshore betting was brought within the purview of the levy to give racing a serious boost. I don't have a horse, a race track in my constituency yet. I've waited for the Boundary <laughs> Commission to put Fakenham in my patch uh, for many years, but they refused to do so. Uh, but I enjoy the little tracks as much as the big, a point that my um, great friend, the Honourable Member for Lowestoft, has just made. It's a great pleasure to follow him. Uh, my brother trains in California, and I've spent many hours as an underpaid hot walker walking his hots around the track in both California and rather cooler at Woodbine in the winter. And I'm a happy and uh, assiduous attendee at Fakenham Races, one of the country's great regional tracks. Uh, Sir George, as I think the House knows, I, I really stand this afternoon because my own family experience, my father was a jump jockey, he rode through the 40s and 50s, he rode for Sir Peter Caslett, he rode Her, Majesty, the, the, her, her late Majesty the Queen Mother's horses, he won the National in the 58 on Mr Watt yeah. and the King George on Lockro, and he with my, with my mother bred Specify, who went on to win the National in 71. But his story is a tragic story because after many head injuries, head injury-induced depression, psychosis, alcohol, addiction, gambling, bankruptcy, his life, and indeed my family's, collapsed in 1967. A very familiar tale of many sporting heroes, and it's a story that, thanks to the great work of racing, we don't see anymore because we're better at looking after jockeys, we're better at uh, detecting uh, injuries, head injuries. And it is in that context, really, that I want to just make very clear that I'm rising today really because I take very seriously the, the unintended consequences, the damage of great sport when not properly regulated, and the damage of, bankrupt, of uh, gambling and bankruptcy. And I'm not at all relaxed about those dangers. And it is, therefore, I hope, all the more powerful when I join colleagues who've spoken today in saying how seriously I worry that this well-intended measure designed to tackle the curse of online gambling is in danger, in fact, of not solving that problem, but exacerbating another, which is the deeply fragile finances of a great sport that I think we all, across all parties here today, have expressed our love for. And I, I'm really fearful that we are in danger of making what in 15 years of government and 30 years of watching I've seen all, uh, as the all too familiar mistake of do somethingery. Something must be done, this is something, let's do it. Using a sledgehammer to crack a nut, the law of unintended consequences, punishing the innocent and doing very little to tackle the real problem that we're after and seriously damaging the, the financial resilience of this great industry. And I think that would be a huge mistake, a great shame on us as a generation and on the government that allowed it to happen. And I'm in, those, in that spirit. I'm here to try and give the minister some helpful tips on how we might find the, the, uh, the right way through this. Um, I wanted to thank the petitioners who brought us here today and the Racing Post and the and British Racing, who've done such good work to raise the issues. And I wanted to look at the British Racing brief and just highlight three really important bits of data they've shared with us. The first, on the impact of these measures. Uh, as a result of the Right to Bet survey, 15,000 horse race bettors surveyed in the autumn. More than half said they'll stop betting or bet less if new checks are introduced. One in 10 bettors already using a black market bookmaker. 40% are prepared to use the black market if clunky enforcement affordability checks are implemented. 90% oppose postcodes or job titles being used to determine their ability to bet, and 26% have already experienced an affordability check ahead of any legislation being passed. Secondly, the briefing makes clear 
the full impact of these reforms as introduced, if they're introduced as they stand, potentially £50 million cost to this industry that is already, as the, my honourable friend, the member for Lowestoft, has just made clear, is already struggling. Uh, that is not something that we should lightly accept. And then thirdly, the point that uh, they, they make that the 500, uh, 500 a year upper threshold for frictionless checks works out at a net spend of just £1.37 a day. Are we seriously intending on damaging the viability of this great sport, this great industry, in order to look busy in monitoring a £1.37 risk? This is a disproportionate measure, and I fear it's going to have major unintended consequences. Uh, I won't, Sir George, repeat, rehearse the arguments that have been made very eloquently by many colleagues. I would, did just want to highlight that there are many who can't speak here today, many peers in the Upper House who've taken a very strong interest, I won't name them, and the members for Stratford, for Whitham, for Hexham, uh, who is a minister and therefore can't speak here today, but himself a distinguished amateur mm -hmm. jockey who would have spoken today if he could. There are many people across <coughs> this House who haven't been able to speak today who <coughs> would have done very forcefully. Uh, I want to make one or two points that haven't uh, perhaps been made as fully as they might. The first is, and this has been made, that racing is a vital main mainstay of the decentralised rural economy all around this country. And it's absolutely key to the levelling up mission that the government has set out. Yes, it is the sport of kings, as others have said. It's also the sport of stable lads and ladesses, the sport of uh, small businesses all around the country. It's the sport that provides the pyramid at the bottom of which are the point-to-points and the pony clubs and all of that grassroots equestrian activity that we love and rely on. And from Yarmouth to Chepstow, Wincanton to Kelso, Cartmel to Catterick, many tracks are really integral to their local economy. It touches on and is instrumental in 60 marginal seats, not a small number in an election year, 80,000 direct jobs, 100,000 indirect jobs, and 8,000 SMEs. This isn't a fringe activity. This is a very key activity at the heart of our uh, decentralised economy. And I would just make this point that uh, this isn't, uh, an earlier speaker suggested, you know, well, we, we don't need betting to support the boat race or to support um, one-off events. Horses are not machines, and you can't have an industry based on one race a year. The reason we can have the derby is that we have all of those other races that build up to it, the same with the Grand National. These are the pinnacles of great pyramids of activity that start at small, windy tracks all around the country. And horses can't just be parked for 364 days a year and then asked to run. And the training of horses, the conditioning of horses, is something that requires activity all through the year. I'll happily give way. You haven't really mentioned those beautiful creatures um, and the joy it is to watch them race. They love uh, to run. And, and, and all those who work with them and train them and look after them um, and how important that is uh, really for, to, to all of us who have spoken today. And I'm grateful to you, Lady. She makes a good point. They're beautiful and uh, what a joy it is to watch them exercising, whether in Malton in Yorkshire or in uh, wherever it is around the country, the, the sight of horses exercising in preparation for racing is part of that rural economy. Uh, uh, secondly, I want to make the point that it is a jewel in the crown as an activity and industry of our global soft power. And the truth is that coming from Newmarket as a child, I've watched as that town and that industry has become very reliant, over-reliant, I would suggest, on a few very wealthy families who've done an amazing service to our sport, but we have to make sure that we're not reliant on a very small number of individuals to maintain the viability of, uh, of an industry, and that puts this uh, debate in a wider context. Uh, uh, crucially, I want to really highlight that there is a very serious problem in our society of addiction to gambling, and particularly online gambling, and there is a growing body of evidence, and I say this as the former Minister for Life Science, somebody who's had a career in, in medical research, that, that the causes of these addictive behaviours, of these cycles of addiction, are, are not simply based on repeat activity. They are a symptom of much deeper underlying causes, uh, often genetic, often and uh, nearly always neurological. There's a whole series of conditions that drive that underlying cycle of addictive behaviour. It's not that you have a bet on a horse and then you have a second, and it's entirely addictive. Indeed, in my experience, betting on horses is Quite the opposite. I very seldom made much money, and I very seldom carry on doing it with that in mind. No, no, what drives the, addiction beha the addictive behaviour is not. It's underpinning uh, neuroscience and wider conditions, and we really need, as a society, to take those very yeah. seriously. Will you give way on that point? Isn't there a more specific uh, distinction there that he almost drew out, which is that um, the placing of a bet and then waiting 
many minutes at, as a minimum and for a result is neurologically distinct to a bet which gives an immediate, yes. uh, immediate hit which has an Im where, where the repeat bet would be based on the physiological immediacy of the previous result, whereas horse racing uh, breaks that and has a different neurological and therefore uh, impact uh, on addiction and therefore wouldn't it be right in law and in policy to completely separate the, these proposals when it comes to online games of chance from the wonderful sport of horse racing. It would be easy to do in law, let's just split the two. Well, my friend anticipates the logic of the argument I was building towards. Exactly right, exactly right. And that's why I go on to make my next point, which is that uh, if we're seriously thinking of tackling this curse of addictive online gambling, um, then surely we should be looking at a whole range of other behaviours as well and other products. And this seems a disproportionate way of tackling a real problem, if indeed that's what it is. And uh, others have mentioned the logical consistency of extending these checks on alcohol, on tobacco, on car hire purchase, on, dare I say it, mortgages, on all sorts of things that we might say, well, people can't afford. And I do worry that this could be the thin end of a very big wedge in which the state decides that it's its job uh, not to regulate properly, but to start asking whether people can actually afford to do it. And that is an Orwellian dystopia I really don't want to uh, live in. The, the truth is we have got to think about racing's sustainable resilience properly. And I absolutely echo the comments of uh, my friend who spoke before me. The truth is prize money is falling fast, costs have risen fast and are stubbornly high, and competition is eating our lunch. And if you look at Irish and French racing, we are hemorrhaging... Uh, a very serious industry. So this is not a situation in which uh, we make a small uh, measure, a small uh, reform uh, against a very healthy industry. This is an industry that is really struggling and needs our help, and I'm worried that the law of unintended consequences will make this worse. Uh, I wanted, just as I close, to make a point about technology. It's been asserted often that we don't have the technology to really be able to do these checks properly. I think that's right at the moment, but wouldn't it be an amazing thing if we decided to lead, we're already an AI powerhouse, if we decided to really use technology properly to start to, underpin, to analyse properly that addictive behaviour and start to look at the betting traits on digital betting that indicate. Now, there are plenty of markers. Indeed, studies have looked at this. There are over 30, 70 markers of harmful gambling have, have been identified, 16 that really drive this activity. And I just suggest that there might be an opportunity for us to use some technology better to really tackle those behaviours online that drive the problem that we're trying to solve. I, I echo the comments of my friend, the member for Suffolk West, that actually on track racing, I would go so far as to say, is one of the best ways to introduce people to responsible gambling. And I remember taking my two children, giving them five pounds each to the 2,000 guineas, and they decided to put it together on an each-way bet, a smart move. They're clever children. <laughs> and even more clever, my son decided to take my daughter's advice because she knows about horses, and he looked at the odds because he knows about numbers, and they put five pounds each way on Galileo Gold, who stormed to victory. And they learned a lot that day about gambling. They saw people who drunk too much, who were losing too much. They didn't. They, well, I took the money and gave it to them. And they discovered a lot. And I think on-track gambling is a fabulous way of actually getting people to realise that most of the decisions in life we take are a gamble one way or another. And it's how you take them that really, <laughs> that really matters. So let me conclude, Sir George, by saying I'm not here in any way for the health of the gambling industry. I'm here interested in the health of UK racing and in the real identification of the at-risk addiction uh, that we see cursing so much of our society, I mean, in particular those games of chance that have driven such addiction. The Minister has a difficult job on his hands. I've sat at that box with packed Westminster houses calling for reform, and I would simply say this to him. I know he has a very difficult job. The Prime Minister in North Yorkshire understands the importance of this industry. The Secretary of State next to Newmarket, she in fact has the breeder of Galileo Gold in her constituency, I know understands it. And I would urge him that it's not too late to change tack and come back with a serious package of measures designed at these two twin problems, the sustainability of racing's finances and the genuine opportunity for this country to lead in harnessing technology and smart regulation for the tackling of gambling addiction. If not, then I would urge him to look seriously at the net loss provisions. They're too simple, they're too, uh, too low, uh, to look at the technology data opportunity to focus on that real challenge and to take very seriously the financial sustainability of racing. When an industry warns that this will cost them 50 million, we have a duty, I think, to listen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very nice.